I've been soaking the pistons overnight in the degreasing tank and it does do a brilliant job if it's given a little bit of time to work. So down in here in the depths is the remaining piston and you can see that having been soaked, even when you rub it with your thumb, it starts to remove all the carbon deposits and oil that's been caked on there. But to get it nice and clean, if you use one of these abrasive pads, which is made of nylon, and it just brings it up a treat. Don't be tempted to use wire wool or anything like that because you could end up scratching the surface too badly. The difficult areas to get in are where the gudgeon pin goes through. But the thing to do with that, rather than a wire brush, you can get a nylon bristle brush, which will do the job perfectly without, again, scratching it too much. And if you haven't got a degreasing tank, just do it in a, in a bucket. And instead of degreaser, you could use diesel. We're going to replace all the rings, so just prise those out with my fingers. The oil scraper's in three parts, and I can't get it out wearing these huge gloves, so I'll take that out on the bench. But this is the nylon brush, and it fits in brilliantly into the grooves, and it just brings that up really well. So once it's done in here, they all go off, get dried, air blown off a bit, and then we'll get the final rings out, the oil scraper, finish the cleaning, and then we can start doing a bit of assembly work. Now, here's a little tip. I don't want to go on about cleaning, but I do love my cleaning of engine parts, and this is great, this tip, for being able to clean out the grooves where the piston rings sit. Because you can see, even though they've been in the degreaser overnight and we've brushed them out with a nylon brush, you've still got carbon deposits in there which haven't come out. So what you do is you take one of your old piston rings that fits the groove, and then you just simply, without twisting it, just pull it apart, like that, breaks into two bits, three in this case, and you take your piece. You can see you've got a lovely sharp edge now, which is the perfect scraper for this groove, and then quite gently scrape out the carbon. You don't want to scratch or, gr or damage the aluminium, so just be a bit gentle with it, and you do need to wear gloves because these rings are really sharp. And there you go, look at all that rubbish coming out. So there's 24 grooves to clean out. So there's your tip. Les, get on with it because we're going to put in a crank. So here's the crank, all cleaned up, same job as the pistons, been put in the degreaser overnight and then all cleaned up with the brush and so on. What I've done here, just to prep it up, is to put some oil through all the oil holes to make sure there's oil within the crank itself and make sure the journals are all smeared in oil. So that stays there for now because I need to prep up the block to receive the crank. Now, it's an aluminium block, nice and light. It was originally the rights to make this were bought by Rover in 1963 from General Motors, and at that time it was called a Buick 215. The Americans didn't like the aluminium blocks because they liked to trust good old cast iron, but their loss is our gain because this is a fantastic engine. In here, in the aluminium go, some new bearing shells. And they've got little locators on them, so you know you've got them the right way around. Third one's really interesting. It's also got two thrust faces on it, on the side, which are this copper colour, and they're to take up the end float on the crank. Everything needs oiling in preparation for that first start. Now, ready for the crank. And I'll tell you what, compared to the weight of the block, this is relatively a pretty heavy bit of kit. Very carefully drop it in so you don't damage anything. So that goes in there like that. Lovely, beautiful. Give it a little bit of a turn. Oh, that's such a lovely feeling, that is. Right, next, the other half of the bearings. Next, the rings. Three rings that go on here, two compression rings and an oil scraper ring. These are the new ones here. This one goes at the top. It's plated on the outside, but it's also got a little bevel on it. Next one down, despite the fact that it says top on it, 
all that means it needs to go with that face facing the top, but that goes in the middle. And then at the bottom is a one-piece oil ring. Now, the original one was a three-piece oil ring, which had two more kind of conventional piston rings sandwiching this other special ring in between. But that all goes, the single-piece oil scraper is easier to fit, although it tends to be a bit brittle, so you have to be a bit gentle with it. That's the first one to go on. Putting them on, it's a case of spreading them as little as you really need to to get them on. So just gently drop it down. It's really useful having the piston in a vise. So that's one down, two to go. One final job to do on each of the eight pistons is to change the big end bearing shells. This is the big end. Little ends down there, which has the gudgeon pin going through it. We're not servicing that, it's fine, no problems at all. This is the big end. These are the old shells down here that I've taken out. You can see pretty worn, especially this one. And these are the new shells. Just pop them in and then we're ready to start inserting pistons. The block is a miracle of modern cleaning techniques. What we had done with this is chemically clean to start with. That didn't get rid of everything, so we then had it bead blasted very carefully to bring it up looking like this, which is fantastic. The bores themselves had honed just to basically take off the glaze that was on there and ended up back at the virgin steel of the liners, but we haven't increased the size of the bores at all. Now the problem when it comes to fitting the pistons, if I can kind of illustrate here, obviously the piston will go in the other way up, but when you try and put the piston in, the rings get in the way. So to get it in, you've got to compress those rings into their grooves. Doing that with your hands is impossible, you'll just damage something, so there's a special tool for it. And this is the tool here, it's a piston ring compressor, you can buy it from any kind of motor factors. You could make your own if you like, but actually I think it's worth investing in it if you're going to do any amount of engine rebuilding. Before we can put the tool on though, we need to oil up the piston, especially around the rings, so it can slide within that tube to get it into the bore. Also the bore needs oiling. Then the tool slides over the top, like that, and then all you do is ratchet it up and it pulls the sleeves of the tool round to compress the rings onto the piston into their grooves. The most important thing though is to make sure that it can still slide in there, which it can and it can turn. A little bit of oil on the big end bearing shell, there we go, like that, and it's off we go with a big hammer. Next job is to put in the camshaft. There's only one camshaft in this V8 that runs the push rods for both sides of the V. Down on the table, I've got the original camshaft, which is this one here, which is looking a little bit worn and dirty, and a brand new one next to it. Now, the reason I'm changing it is because I wanted a performance camshaft rather than the standard. And the difference between them is, it's quite subtle, but if you look hard, it's the profile of these lobes. That one there pushes the push rod up and opens the valve further and keeps it open for longer than that lobe there on the original camshaft. What that does is give you more of your fuel air mixture into your cylinders and you get a bigger bang. Next thing is to sort out the timing chain and the timing gears. To do that, we need to make sure that this piston one is at top dead center so just turn the crankshaft round and as it comes to the top of its stroke it goes right up to the top stops briefly before it then comes back down again and you want it right at the top in its stop position which is there and then down here the smaller of the two gears which goes on the crankshaft slides on and there's a woodruff key on the end of the crankshaft so it has to slot over that and you'll notice that on the front of it, there's a little dot, okay? That's an important timing mark. The next gear that goes on is this, which is completely adjustable, and that will slot on there like so. The two are joined together with this, which is the timing chain, which will slot over there like that. And need to make sure that the two dots here on the big sprocket and the little sprocket line up. And then I'll know that the timing is right. What this does 
is sort out the relative timing of the valves opening and shutting relative to the crankshaft rotation, which is obviously critical in terms of the position of the pistons in the cylinders. Okay, now the two dots aren't completely in line yet. They're probably a little bit less than half a tooth out, but that's fine because this bigger sprocket is completely adjustable. And that's the difference compared to the old one because you would have had to have been just half a tooth out. We don't have to with this fantastic kit I've got now. So all that remains is to be able to knock on the smaller sprocket completely onto its shaft. Pete, mate, yeah. can you get me a piece of the tubing from the roll cage? Well, let's do. Hang on, just pass it here. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so what, well, that's going to go on there? Well. OK. And then, and then which bit do I hit exactly? You've got to put the cam followers in first, but you need to lubricate up the camshaft, and there's special lube for that, which contains a high concentration of zinc dithiophosphate. Stops all the scuffing and stuff, and it's a lovely colour. So that's all the followers in. Next, one of the two heads. And Pete, what do they say about heads? If you want to get a head, get a hat. So there we go, I can now put on the heads because I've got a hat and I've got a head. There's one of two heads, there you go, down there, all cleaned up nicely. And you're probably wondering how I got that beautiful finish on it. Well, it was chemically treated, but then after that, I've got to say this very quietly, I took it home at one o'clock in the morning and put it in the dishwasher. And she doesn't know. <laughs> anyway, we've got new valve springs on here. They have to be new valve springs because the valves open faster than on the standard vehicle. So these came with a kit with the cams. And then on this side, we've bedded all the valves in with the paste, sorted them all out so it's ready to go. First on though, is the gasket. All we need is a whole stack of bolts. You mean I look like a postman? Now, as you know, we have the ultimate mishmash of bodywork to sort out for this vehicle, and Robbie's going to solve it with me. We've salvaged all these parts, yeah. and obviously they would have been damaged before they ended up in the salvage yard. They've got dents and stuff all over them. What's the first process we need to do in terms of getting these up to finish paint? Well, the first thing we've got to do, Mark, is we've got to start off with degreasing them and cleaning them up. As you said, they're all second-hand panels, so there'll be plenty of contamination on these panels. OK, so I, I steam clean them back at the workshop. Mm. But that won't be enough to... No, no. Uh, steam clean will remove uh, you know, the normal contamination from rain marks and stuff, but any uh, other contamination from the road, tree saps and contamination which you can pick off from emissions and vehicles, they need to be removed by uh, solvents and water-based degreasers. So we just work all over it, yeah? Just as if you were normally washing it? Yeah, give it a good wipe to about half a panel at a time. Uh, that way you give it a chance to, uh, to wipe it off, because it's, uh, it's a wipe on, wipe off process. Wiping on to obviously soften any contamination, wiping it off to remove it. Tell you what, it is amazing. I mean, I, I steam cleaned these at about 1.30 in the morning and thought I got them really, really clean, but look at the state of that. Right, they're all cleaned up, these two wings, so it's time to assess the damage. And this panel is much worse than the other one. So just let's go through and identify what it is we've got to fix. Well, we've got a, what we call an outward dent here, Mark, where something right. from the inside has pushed this out. So we right. need to sort that out and, and knock it back. OK. Uh, but on the top here, we have a couple of normal general dents. Where this one looks like something's been dropped on it. Bit of a car park dent here where somebody's opened the door onto your wheel arch. So. Right. We need to have a look at that one. And we've got a small knock on this front corner, which again, this one's quite deep, so we'll probably uh, knock some of this out from the inside first before right. we try and uh, attempt to fill it. <laughs> Just gently tap through these high areas. Yep. So you can hear it knocking on the... Yep. 
some dudes because it's a spike. Yeah. This will tighten it up and right. uh, stop the flexibility of them in that area. I wondered what that was for when I bought this set. I thought, what on earth would you use one of those for? <laughs> Putting in small nails. <laughs> yes, exactly. Make tiny little nails. I could make a fortune, you know, that, like Jamie Oliver sells his pans. I could just sell big hammers, couldn't I? All right, mate, stop there a sec. What we've done, let's take this off, is I've put the panel back on, we've sorted out the dents, we're now taking off the paint layers over where we're going to put on some filler. But this thing's a DA, isn't it, which stands yeah. for what? That's a, a dual action sander. Right, so what does that mean? It basically means that you've got a circular motion where it's going to be sanding through. But it's also oscillating, so it's orbiting uh, at right. the same time. So we get this nice cross cut. And what yeah. grit paper have you got on there? Well, to start off by removing the paint, we're going with an 80 grit, because you don't need anything coarser than that to remove paint, it'll remove it quick enough. Uh, and then we'll, we'll feather that out, or so smooth it around the edge with a, a 180s, and then finish that again with a, a 320s grit. The purpose of this, what we're trying to do, is get rid of all the paint over the area that we're going to fill, because it's very important that the filler sticks to metal and not to paint. If you put filler over paint, when it all starts flexing, you can get separation between the filler and the paint, which is what Robbie was just telling me a bit earlier on, and you get what's called a contour map around it, where you can see the area that's been filled. So we've got to get all that paint off around the areas that are filling, not the whole of the, the panel, though, because if we take all the paint off, it'll take forever, and it's totally unnecessary. This is quite difficult here because we've obviously got these dints in it, but you um, might have to do those by hand. Pete, yeah. can you put one of these on my Christmas present list? You have two options, all right, everybody? Either you can watch me put together the rest of this engine or you can watch paint dry. Board yet? Engine? Right, good, now that I've got your full attention again, just a bit of a recap on where we've got to with the engine. It's a three and a half litre of V8, the original engine that came out of the old Range Rover that I used as the basis for this project vehicle. Pistons are in, camshafts in, both heads are on and torque down. Now it's time to put on the rocker shafts and the push rods. Very simple job. Once we've done that, we can get onto a really interesting part of this rebuild, which is valve timing, which we've started to set up down here. And to be honest, none of us understand any of it. Anybody got any more ideas about the valve timing yet? Yeah. No, keep reading the books. Valve timing is all about, by the way, making sure that obviously the valves open and close at the right time in relation to the crankshaft cycle. That's your introduction. Les, how do we do it? Because <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> well, apparently, yeah. we've got this H180 camshaft with 262 degrees of lift, 29 degrees, 59 degrees, 108 degrees, with VS44 valve springs. Right. So that was really useful that he spent the last half hour reading that manual because we're now so much better off, aren't we? Let me explain in simple terms how this system works. Now, if it's preaching to the converted, teaching the old grandma to suck eggs, huge, humongous apologies. First of all, crankshaft. When the crankshaft turns, via the timing chain, turns the camshaft, OK? The camshaft has its lobes on, which push up and down as the lobes come round, the cam followers. And now the inlet valve is opening, so that's sucking. As it goes round further, it then starts to squeeze. Then the next half a turn of the crank, you get the bang. So you've got suck, squeeze, bang. And then you can see the lobe here now for the exhaust valve coming up because the last stage of the four-stroke cycle is blowing. So it needs to open the exhaust valve to be able to blow out the exhaust gases. 
And there we go, the exhaust valve is opening. So, well, in two complete turns of the crankshaft, you get one complete revolution of the camshaft. Now, the important thing is obviously that these valves open at the right stage of the cycle and that they stay open for the right length of time. This is a performance cam, and the big issue with that is the valves will open sooner and stay open longer, and we've got it right to get the benefit out of the camshaft. Right, what we've done is set up piston one at top dead centre and then set a marker down here with a bit of welding wire on our gauge, disc gauge here at TDC, top dead centre. Next thing up here, we have a dial gauge that's set up on the inlet valve rocker for cylinder one. And what I'm going to do is just turn this round and watch for the numbers increasing on the dial gauge as the rocker starts to move up as the valve opens and then find out where it's at its maximum lift. It's going up, going up, going up. So you can read off here now that when that valve is at maximum opening, it's happening 112 degrees after top dead center. Now, according to all that gibberish Les was going on about earlier, we need that point to be 108 degrees after top dead center. So if it's 112 disease, it's happening too late. So to advance it, to make it happen sooner, all I've got to do is undo these four bolts with a little Allen key. Then get hold of the nut on the end of the camshaft. So there we go. A little nudge on there, tighten them up. Okay, right, so what I need to do now is check, adjust, check, adjust, and the checking of this is quite straightforward. All we need to do is move the crankshaft right round so that we're way before it should be at the top. We're going to take it 10 degrees back, which should be before it's at its top point, because we know that's 5 degrees either side of 108 degrees, which is what we're aiming for. Then on our dial gauge, measure what we have on there. Then take it 10 degrees the other way, so you've gone hopefully past the point at which it will have been at its topmost, and see what it measures again. And if it's exactly the same, we know 108 degrees must be bang in the middle of it in its dwell angle. So it is all a bit complicated, this. I promised you some complicated physics. So just a bit of checking. We'll take it back now to 98 degrees after top dead centre. And that reads 2.43. Then if we keep turning it round, we get to 118 degrees and bang on 2.43 so we know at 108 degrees it's in the center of its dwell angle at its maximum opening that set the valve time now one other interesting thing about the number 108 did, Jill's laughing now see she spent a lot of time in Tibet and we were talking about the fact that I wonder whether the Dalai Lama has ever rebuilt a V8 now it turns out we don't know the answer to that but it turns out that 108 is also the number of beads in a Buddhist's rosary. How spooky is that? Now, guess what I forgot to do, eh? Absolutely, the old core plugs. What a muppet, I hear you say, because I should have changed the core plugs, which are these little devils. You can see there's three of them here on the side of the block, but they are like caps, if you like, to the water jacket inside the block. There is a bit of a safety thing, so that if there's a bit of a problem, pressure builds up, these will pop out rather than breaking anything more important inside or exploding or anything nasty like that. There are three on this side, three on the other side, a couple in this end. I've got to replace them all. So we're just going to knock the hell out of it in a kind of gentle, caring, sensitive way, all right? Most important thing is you need to deform the centre of the little cap first, so it kind of pulls the sides in before you then try and knock it on the side to rotate it. You'll see, it'll all become clear. So a bit of a belt in the middle, like that, and then hit on one edge, still inside the plug though, so, not, so you're not going to damage the block. The whole thing starts to rotate. It might drop inside here, but you'll be able to collect it. And with a pry bar, you just hook underneath it and pull it out. Putting in the new one, all it needs is a bit of non-setting gasket, which just helps it seal to start with before it corrodes a little bit in place. And also a little bit on the block where it's going to sit. Like so. Then place the core plug over the top. The important thing is to knock it in square, and the ideal tool for the job is a socket. The socket needs to fit perfectly inside the core plug. And then gently just tap it round, doing the 12 six, three, nine exercise until you're happy it's square. And these just want to be just lower than flush with the block. 
Here we go, job done. Right, over here on the old benchy poos. Now, this is a timing case. All right, it's all very nice, it's all been cleaned up, but slight problem because a stud has broken off here. So we've filed it down to make it flat. What fits on top of there is the water pump. This is the old one, which just slots on there like that. Now, we're replacing this for a brand new piece because this is all rather gnarled up here. So this is going to be scrap, but we've kept it long enough to use as a guide for the drill to drill out the stud. So that will slot on top of there. What I'm going to do is drill down and just mark the top of the stud, not drill straight through with this, otherwise we'll have nothing to thread. So I'll mark it with this, then put a 5mm drill in, drill that through and then tap it out, all right? Oh, hang on, you can't see, can you? There you are. What I've done down there to make sure that I don't drill too far in is I set a stop on there for three mil down. If I just take this off now, give it a bit of a... I'll tell you what, we're making this look difficult. <laughs> look at that, you see, lovely job done. See, I've just marked it on the top in there, but enough where we'll be able to see the thread. We'll now drill through that with a five mil drill and then tap it out with me little tap and then sorted. So just to test, a quarter UNC bolt screws in beautifully. So a nice little repair job that, and you could use the same technique on any kind of casting. Right. Next job is to resurface the oil pump or part of it. So give us a second, so I've just got to pop down the cellar to get it. Ah, uh, I know it's not good for your fitness, but I always go down by the stairs and up via the lift. Now, this is the oil pump, but the pump bit is basically these two gears that sit like that. This one is driven by the same shaft that drives the distributor. It works by, as these two rotate, these two big cogs, it squeezes oil between them, which is what creates the oil pressure. But the problem is, where they've been rotating on this flat plate, they've put these score lines in it, which could result in a loss in oil pressure. Probably wouldn't be dramatic at this stage, but seeing as we've got it apart, we might as well sort it out. One way of resurfacing this, quite a simple technique, is to get some 400 grit wet and dry paper and then stick it to a piece of MDF. Now MDF is brilliant for this job because it's machined completely flat and that's absolutely critical. Put a little bit of machine oil on your 400 grit, like so, and the most important thing, make sure you keep it flat while you move it. And then literally, sit down, make yourself comfortable, watch your favourite workshop show on the telly, and just keep moving this backwards and forwards, keep changing the direction so you're not always going in one direction. And slowly but surely, you will resurface it. So a few more jobs to do to the engine, starting with putting on its very own tea strainer. Actually, it's the oil pickup. It's very simple, a couple of bolts and a bit of that non-setting gasket, and then we can put the sump on. Oh, yes, we're moving on a pace now. Very, very exciting. We are now ready to put on the clutch and the gearbox before dropping the whole lot into the rolling chassis. Now, one thing is utterly confusing me. If you've got a broken leg, how is it one of these is going to help you? First bit to go on is the flywheel. Now, it looks like a brand new flywheel, but it isn't. It's the old one, and I've just had it resurfaced, which is why you get these fantastic kind of circular marks. Now, plonking this on is a case of just putting it onto the end of the crankshaft. What we've already got in here are the new core plugs, plus also the oil seal around the end of the crank. That's quite a fiddle to put in. You have to be pretty careful with that. And this just plonks over the end of the crankshaft, like so. But the holes are all a bit eccentric. 
So you need to just rotate it all until they all line up. And then a little bit of the old locking compound on here. What have you done to your thumb, Mark? Nothing. No, no, the, the plaster. This one here? Yeah, I, I wouldn't be too proud of that as a vet if I sent home a little puppy with a bandage on its paw and it looked like that. Bit of a rush job. I um, speared myself with a small screwdriver taking off some spire clips. Nice that you're concerned though, Pete. Yeah. Anyway, it's good to have you back. Thanks. Have you got the stair lift in there? Yes. Is it working? So, so. The clutch itself is two main bits. This is the friction plate. And this is a heavy duty one because this vehicle is now going to be much heavier than a standard vehicle. So we've gone for the heaviest duty Land Rover clutch we can get. So that's the friction plate. And then this bit is the pressure plate. So the pressure plate is attached to the flywheel and to the engine. The friction plate via these splines is attached to the spigot that goes on the shaft into the gearbox. And obviously that means the two things can rotate freely unless this is sandwiched between here and the flywheel, in which case the engine and the gearbox are connected. Right. Bell housing, R380 gearbox in black and transfer box. You'll remember seeing the gearbox and the transfer box built earlier in the series. Now it's time to fix all this lot to the engine. Just inside here, you can see where the thrust bearing is to operate the clutch and the clutch fork. So when you press on the clutch pedal, this moves this up and down like that, but when you press on it, it pushes it towards the engine. The thrust bearing then presses on this diaphragm spring here, and as it presses on it, it releases the pressure on the friction plate, which then allows the engine to turn separately to the gearbox, if you like. But the whole lot now has got to be joined together before we can put it in the rolling chassis, and it's a, a kind of multi-man job, this. So Pete, mate. Yes. Les, mate. We need to go like that. Go on. This is going to come to here, isn't it? No, mine's going to come. And now. Yeah, we'll come right round this way and head that way. He's been very glossy, isn't he? Whose show is this, Pete? Come on, it's our show. Ooh. <laughs> We've got four mountains, two at the front, two on the gearbox. We are literally half a bolt out here. It's looking good, though, isn't it? Yeah. Right, that's it. Set in. in. There she goes. Yes. It doesn't matter how many times you put an engine in a vehicle, it always feels fantastic. It has got to be the best part of building any car or vehicle. Look at that. Three and a half V8, R380 gearbox, all sorted. Yes! Right, now you get to see the finished colour for the very first time. This is the only bit that's had finished paint on it, because it has to go on first. It's the bulkhead. Thank you very much, Les. Anybody who scratches this? Thank you, Pete. Got it? I got it. It's a dead man. Whoa. <laughs> you worried me then. Do you like the colour, Pete? I think it's sort of royal blue, isn't it? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of these... It's one of these flip jobs, so it does very subtly change colour as you walk around it. Oh. But I absolutely adore it. A couple of brackets go down here, and then we've got to set this up so it's in the perfect position, because everything else then will get bolted to this. But before we put on any more panels, which have yet to be painted, we need to start building up everything on here, so pedal box, all that kind of stuff, because this is the kind of hub of the vehicle, if you like. Everything is attached to the bulkhead. It feels so good to be starting to rebuild this thing again after months and months of just cleaning and restoring and customising. We're getting there. Right, it's very, very important that you put all the things on the bulkhead in the right order, otherwise you'll get into serious problems. And the first thing to be put on is the windscreen wiper mechanism. Not this yet, first this, the wheel box. There we go, that's that sorted. Next, steering column. Now, 
I've laid out the entire wiring loom, mostly for my benefit and less for yours, it has to be said, because this is the only way I can kind of visualise wiring, is to put the things out on the bench and see where everything connects. Now, if we start this end of the wiring loom, we have all the wires that go to the engine and also to the back of the vehicle for the lights and so on in this big clump here. But you'll spot a bit of a problem here. We've got some cut wires. This loom was originally from a diesel engine vehicle and these wires went to the glow plug system. We don't need those, so we're going to have to do a bit of rewiring there, which is not a problem, doesn't matter. Next down here is obviously the fuse box. That goes on the inside of the bulkhead. Again, very obvious. This feed goes to the windscreen wiper motor. OK, that's there. This one plug goes to a big bit, which is the heater. That's easy to understand. This is the heater control wires for the fan control. Then a few wires, four wires here going to the ignition switch. This big pile of spaghetti with a few of its bulbs already attached goes to the binnacle and all our clocks and dials and things. Again, not difficult to understand. And then the remaining big clump goes to these switches which are on the steering column. Now, the good thing about these is each one of these plugs has a special matching partner. Male and female, you can't plug the wrong thing into the wrong socket. Let me just take them out. Once I've got it in bits, like that, and like that, I can take the whole of the loom with me, including the fuse box, like so. Leave that behind, I don't need that yet. And then plonk it in the bulkhead. That is pretty much it for now because we've got to put all the bits on that the wiring loom attaches to. There's a huge temptation to clean this wiring loom off the vehicle before you start with electrical cleaner, but actually that's a bit of a mistake because you might inadvertently unplug something and then not know where it goes back to. So it's better to get it all in place and then clean it afterwards. Right, a couple of plates to go on the other side of the bulkhead where those wires go through and then we can move on. Another big bit to go on, brake pedal, servo, master cylinder for the brakes and its little reservoir. Slots in here, like so. Pete, I'll need you just to hang on to this. Yes. And then it bolts through from the inside. A little tip with this is when you're cleaning it up, don't press on the brake pedal because you could spray brake fluid either in your eye or in somebody else's. Oh, we've got a heater now, because it gets cold, you know, in the desert at night. I can't go much further on the bulkhead because I need to get back to Oxford to the paint shop to paint up the wings, put every panel on the vehicle, and then we're going to spray the whole vehicle in one. And why the powder puff from the Black and White Minstrel Show? OK, well, the powder puff basically is uh, we're going to rub that onto the body filler area, yeah. which you're going to do now, Mark. All right, OK. okay. Um, and when you rub it on, it will actually put a sort of black powder coating over the surface. All right, so let's just put that on now, then. So you literally... I could get one of these for the wife, couldn't I? So it just puts that dust over the surface? Just, just puts this uh, dry black dust over the surface. Okay. So this is the equivalent of what we've used before in aerosol, just black aerosol paint kind of misted over it. It does the same job as the, as the black aerosol, uh, unfortunately with the health and safety standards towards solvents and mm. solvent abuse and emissions, uh, we've now changed from uh, onto the, the dry powder right. and taken out the aerosols from the, from the body repair altogether. Just that really um, stupid. Pete? No, you look fine. Is it not black? No, it's before. Is it not black? <laughs> so it doesn't work on skin then? No. Oh, there we are. Well, Bizarre. it didn't actually get to the skin, did it? Because it's about four days of growth there. But your grey beard is now black. You can really go <laughs> off people, can't you? Keep it nice and flat. Yeah. We need to change the variation of the uh, sanding so it's not all in one, right. in one direction. You can see quite clearly there, can't you, where that um, powder is stuck in the groove? Yeah, which means it's uneven there. And that's where the dent was. Yeah. Okay. 
OK, get in there. So, I mean, you're much further on with your bit, so what happens now? Once we get to this stage here, uh, we then need to uh, change the grit on the pad to a slightly finer grit, which is what, uh, what we call now a 180 grit, yeah. which again, we'll put some more black uh, dry powder coat on it, and we'll just finish that to the, to the stage that we want it to be before primer. OK. And then um, this is the quite difficult bit around here, isn't it? Because yeah, there's lots of curves, so... All right. Right, we're all kitted up and ready for painting. The panels have been blown off and then degreased again. And just to show you down here, which was the dent that I was working on with Robbie, has actually come out really, really well. We had to put a second layer of filler in it because there was a little bit of a dint still left in it, but it's really, really good now. So the next process is to paint up to a level of high build primer before the top coat. And that's four coats of paint. It's an etch primer first, and then three coats of high build primer after that. So it's going to be my first go at proper paint. I've only ever done the underside of a panel before, but Robbie's going to take me through the process. And hopefully, the result will be exactly what I want. So just talk me through it. OK, Mark, we're going to start off uh, in this bottom corner underneath the wheel arch and then we're going to follow the line of the wings all the way up to the top come around the front and then finish off on the top of the wings with one nice even coat OK OK Mark, as easy as that <laughs> How many years have you been doing it? You don't want to spray it like that. Right. You want to spray it that way. Right. So okay. the fan's that way. For the way oh, right, so the fan goes out like that, does it? fan goes like that, yeah. Right, OK. So you're going to be pulling that spigot right the way around to there. Yeah. And then let go. Yeah. And then come to the back. See if you can point the gun like this yeah. along that edge. Yeah. Right, and we're going to paint this like this panel is separate from the other side up to here. Right. And then we bring this one up to here. Yeah. And then across. That'll then go from here, it'll be doing that action. Yeah, and then when you get to here, yeah. always let your, your trigger go from full. So let the trigger go off the end, and then before you start moving, then as you start moving, pull the trigger, let right. go. Yeah. Move up, pull the trigger, let go. Right, so you don't, so you're always starting and stopping off the panel. Yeah. Let's see how we get on. Okay. Yeah. Try, try and keep the gun straight. Yeah. Yeah, now pull. That's it. Front section again, treat it like a, a single panel. Yeah, you treat it as though it's a square panel. Yeah, although it's got a, a, an angle to it, you're not going to be painting that point to the same point time and time again. Yeah, and that's your first coat. And how is that? How is that? End? Not too bad at all. Not too bad. So, we let that dry completely now. That wants to be uh, left on its own to flash off, what we call flash off, to allow solvent to come off into the atmosphere, to allow the acid to do its work, which is to etch into the steel. OK, so this is going to be the first coat of the high build primer. Yeah. OK, so what are you going to do with that, all over the panel or not? No, with this first coat, because there's already paint on the panel, from previous paint work that's been done on it, uh, what we need to try and do is just to fill the areas up that we've taken back to bare metal and where we put filler on to the uh, repair. Mm -hmm. So we build that up with this first coat, um, and then as we continue from there on with the second and third coat, we will then do the whole wing with coat two and three. Crack on. OK. Closer, Mark, and a bit slower. OK. OK, that's dried off a little bit now, so we can put on the second layer of the high build primer. OK, well done. You all right? Oh, pleased with that. Very pleased with that. Now, the wings, you saw us spraying those up. They're now on, but ultimately these wings are only bolted on by a few bolts, so nothing terribly interesting there. Just to update you as well underneath, inner wheel arches here, I've just stone chipped those. It's practical, but it also gives a really nice finish. Back here, 
Roll cage is on, powder coated now in black. Now, the reason we've had to put that on is because effectively the way it fixes down is part of the tub. The panels themselves now been flatted since they've been primed, and I'll show you why that's really important. The bonnets had exactly the same preparation and layers of paint on it as the wings did. But now with guide coat on this, on top of the primer, you can see an outline here, and that is the outline of the filler. You can't feel it, but you can see it. And if you went on and put gloss on that, you would see the outline of the filler, and it would look horrendous. So the next job is now to flat down the primer using 400 grit on a block to get it absolutely smooth before we then go and put the gloss on top. So there's quite a lot of work to be done still in terms of flatting these panels down. Then we've got a couple of hours of masking to do before finally Robbie can get on and put my fantastic paint colour on the top. Masking is all about attention to detail. Very important with a vehicle like this, it can take two or three hours to mask it properly. But if you do it well, like these guys do, then you end up with a fantastic paint finish and you don't paint the things you don't want to paint. Pete, yeah. you know I say attention to detail and masking. Yeah. Just come in a sec. Yeah. <laughs> Whilst Robbie's busy painting, I'm with Eddie Hilborn, a new friend who is a master at colour. Allegedly. So, there are going to be some very obvious questions here that Everyone. kind of help me understand a bit more about what goes onto a vehicle. Yep. OK, because it is a real science, isn't it? It is. First question, which is the most obvious, what is paint actually made of? Paint is made up of three basic components. The first component would be uh, a resin, and we have uh, solvent-borne resins and we also have water-borne resins here to create the different paint systems. Uh, secondary would go in would be the pigment, so basically the colour, okay. and finally you have solvents. We have different blends of solvents to go into different things in different products. Okay, what is, the, what is the solvent for, just to mix the whole lot together? The solvent is there to bind the resins and the pigments together, but it's also there to assist in the sprayability of the product, the flow, uh, what we call sag resistance, so basically to stop it running off the panel. Does that work on old ladies? Sag resistance? Yes. Yeah. Well, you, if, you, if, if I was, if did, if I was to go and spray my mother-in-law with some of this stuff, would she just tighten up a bit? Well, if it did, we could actually sell quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> now, our colour has actually uh, got a slight flip in it as well, hasn't it? Yes. Our finished colour, because we only want the best, obviously. Let's just go through the paint system that's been used on my Land Rover. What we're looking for is uh, a complete system to protect the vehicle. If we just put colour on, you'll get water and moisture in there and it will rust. So we must start with a sound substrate to start from. We take an etch primer, which is basically there to give you your anti-corrosive properties, but also to give you your first grip or, or etch into the metal to, give it, to make it stick. So does that chemically eat its way into the surface of the metal then? Yes, it does, yes. Okay. Then on top of that, we sprayed primer. We did. A number of layers of primer. A number of layers. This is what we call a, a primer filler. It gives you build and enables you to be able to sand that down without going right the way through. OK, and then on top of that? On top of that, we go with the colour coat. This is the one. This is the one that's going to make it look just a little bit different. This is the colour coat, or more commonly known as the base coat. This doesn't give you any protection. Right. This purely gives you the look. It okay. gives you the aesthetics. And we want my Land Rover to have, together, ready, the look. OK, it's very important, isn't it? It is. Very important indeed. So, that has a... Sp it's, it's a blue, mm -hmm. obviously, but it then has a special pigment in it to flip. So, yes. so how does that work? OK, the, the special pigment that we've used in, in uh, the colour for your Land Rover is a new pigment that's been introduced. Uh, they're called Zeralix. It, it does have the effect of giving you quite a good, what we call, colour travel. So the colour changes depending on where you're viewing it. I mean, what's in that? What is your, in the Zeralix pigment? Zeralix, it's, it's a special type of pearlescent type pigment, but what it actually does is as the light hits it, it kind of bends the light right. and allows it to change colour. Right, OK. And then finally, to give it its gloss and its sheen and its protection. Yeah, finally, the final coat, which gives it its majority of its protection from not only um, the elements as far as the sun and everything else, but you know, if you want to go and polish your car on a Sunday, you need to make sure that you've got something on there that's going to last. And for that, we use clear coats. <laughs> we 
We have put on all the brake pipes now and the brake system is on. We've bled the brakes, but we haven't yet clipped the pipes on because I had a few problems finding some P-clips to do that, but they're in the post, I am told. Also, we've mirrors are on and the door cappings are on. These are normally just plain galvanised, but I've also painted them up in this rather special silver because I just want to make it look that bit more special. Also, most of the dash is on the back of the bulkhead now and the wiring's all in place. Around the back, we've put a stay bar in across here to give some extra support and strength to the rear of the tub because we're not going to have a conventional tailgate. We're making something rather special and also got all the wiring in for the rear lamp. So things are moving on a treat, but today is a very special day. I always say it's a very special day, but it is because we are going to start the VH for the very first time, come hell or high water. But there are a few jobs to do to plumb it in first. And before I can plumb anything in, I need to sort out the handbrake. Unfortunately, the handbrake bracket that I lovingly restored and painted up doesn't actually fit my gearbox. So fortunately, having my little 90 that's kind of been put on hold a bit, because this project is taking much longer than anticipated, I can actually borrow bits off it and have a look how things are supposed to fit. So I'm now stealing the handbrake bracket off my old 90 to be able to use as a template to modify the bracket that I've already painted up for the project vehicle. So, this is the bit from a four-cylinder. This is the bit that we got hold of as a V8 part, because obviously that's what our vehicle is now. And you can see I painted up, it looks beautiful, completely refurbished, but they are very different. The main plate on the back that's lying on the table is the same, but it's this bracket here that fixes to the back of the gearbox that is very, very different. Now that is going to slow us down considerably. Let me just show you the the brake system. It's not like a conventional handbrake that you're probably more familiar with that when you pull the handle actually uses the same brake shoes on the rear hubs that you would use for your foot brake. This bit actually bolts onto the back of the gearbox and is a transmission brake. It breaks the rotation of the rear prop shaft. It has two shoes, pretty ordinary looking brake shoes, an adjuster down here which you just adjust with this on the back as you turn it it just either moves these in or out at the bottom. The actual mechanism itself is at the top here, very simple. It's got a little piston inside here with some rollers and as you pull on the handbrake, it pulls on the lever on the back, pulls the piston and then a couple of little rollers roll up some ramps which push out the side pistons which move the brake shoes in and out. Now it's a very efficient handbrake but there is one problem. If you ended up, for instance, jacking up one rear wheel your handbrake wouldn't work at all because the diff would allow the whole thing to move because you've got one wheel in the air that can rotate backwards. So be warned if you have a transmission brake. Les is the man to sort out the refabrication, so he will be working on the brackets while me and Pete, mate, get on with the fuel system. Now, the fuel system begins, obviously, at the point where you plunge the nozzle into your fuel pipe that goes into your tank when you fill up, and that, for us, is up here. Now, this rather lovely piece has actually come from a Series 3, because the original vehicles, the original 100-inch Land Rovers from the late 1970s, had this filler, and I wanted mine to have exactly the same. The cap fits on nicely like that, but choosing to use this kind of filler from a Series 3 has caused all kinds of problems, because on a 90, and we're using effectively a 90 tank from a Defender, the filler is further back and further down, like it is on my old 90 over there which I don't think looks very attractive and certainly not in keeping with this vehicle. But by putting my filler higher up and further forward has created all kinds of problems. Actually, I lied. It was, uh, it was after weeks of me and Les discussing how we were going to get the fuel into the fuel tank that we ultimately decided this was the best compromise. But it still had all kinds of problems because this is the pipe that then feeds from here into the fuel tank. Now that fits on like that, which is not a problem, apart from the fact we had to cut a hole in the back of the bulkhead. So that goes on like that, then the problems start down below. There's our hole in the bulkhead we've cut, no problem at all with the pipe coming through, but you can see the pipe should have come through this little arch here. Now, that becomes even more obvious when you look at a new tank, of which this is a new galvanised tank, which I bought in good faith, thinking I'd use it, and you can see the main filler comes out the back of the tank and we need it to come out of the top. So, had to go and get another tank and then take it down the road to a radiator factory to get it refurbished. Yes, we will be moving on with the fuel system jolly shortly. Kaboom!
It's a tank pee. And there you go. Look at that. They did a lovely job on that for us. So they've put on a vertical one and three quarter inch pipe there as our fuel filler. And they've also moved the breather from here over to this side. So now it should fit. Little tip here, by the way, as well. We had to put this bolt on first to drop it in. And you know what it's like when you put a washer on a bolt like this and you try and feed it into something, the washer moves away from the end of the bolt. We've just super glued that on to keep it in place. And then this lot will go up in here. Right, that didn't work. Right, and again. Yep. Very kind. There. Next thing to go on is the fuel pump itself. This is an inboard fuel pump, so called, because it actually fits in the tank rather than being separate. On the old Range Rover, it was a separate pump attached to the chassis. It's just got a filter on the bottom, pump there, and then the output pipe is here. So it fits through this hole here down into the tank like that, and then there's just a few screws hold it in place. So basically, the fuel comes down here through your filler, down the big pipe, and that will fit on there like that. It's a beautiful fit, works very nicely after all our problems. This hole here is gonna be for the fuel gauge sender unit. We're not gonna put that in at the moment. Then the fuel will come up the pump through this pipe here. There'll be a connector across to there, feed through the next pipe, through to the filter bowl, which is just down, fixed to the chassis down there, and then onto the carburetors, and the return feed comes up this other pipe, and then when I've taken this red plug out, that will screw into the tank there. So just a few screws, and this part of the fuel system sorted. Right, so I've sorted out the fuel tank. The fuel system just needs some carburetors on the end. We'll do that in a second, because we're moving on now to the exhaust system. Now, I'm putting on a completely new performance-based exhaust system, because you know me, I like to have the best. Starting at this end, where the gas comes out, we have a tailpipe. Then we have a silencer. Now, this is a straight-through silencer, where the sound is absorbed with what's like a kind of wool inside it. Much more efficient and doesn't give you so much back pressure, so lets the engine breathe easier. Then a Y-pipe, because obviously we've got a V8, we're going to have two headers, so it needs to come to one. That is in its kind of raw state. This and the headers are going to be ceramic coated and will look brilliant, but for now we're going to test fit it first. Then the really interesting bit here at the front. This is one of the headers that came off the original engine. Not only is it the most ugly thing you've ever seen in your life, it's also an ultimate compromise, basically. It's not really designed for great performance. And you can see that when you compare it with the new header that I'm putting on here. Now, exhaust technology is a real science. I don't pretend to understand it all, but I'll try and give you some of the basics. These pipes that come down here from each of the exhaust ports are called the primaries. And it's important to try and get those as long as you can in terms of getting great torque out of the engine, but also, if possible, to keep them all the same length, which is why they're all a bit convoluted. But for any particular engine, the diameter, the bore of these tubes and their length, there is an optimum for a given engine. And this is as close to the optimum as you can get for my three and a half litre V8. So this, you can see completely different lengths in terms of the primaries and frankly, is only worthy of the scrap bin. My baby's getting this lot. program you saw that we had a few problems when it came to fitting the transmission brake because the bracket we had didn't actually fit the transfer box so Les has been busy sorting out the bracket and modifying it and you can see where the weld is here where he's put on a little bit of angle iron with a couple of holes in it. it's a new bracket which means it can fit up here it drops in like that on the back of the transfer box just a couple of bolts in the back here and two more further up forward Next to go on is the back plate. It's already got the shoes in place, and that just drops over the flange for the rear prop shaft, and then has four bolts, like that. And then finally, on top, the now painted drum slots over the top and is just held in place on the flange with a couple of 
big screws. There we go. Transmission brake sorted. Now, if you've ever tried to clean carburetors yourself, as we have on a number of occasions, it is a complete nightmare because there's so many little nooks and crannies to try and do the job properly is very, very difficult. So, I found somebody who could do them for me. Costs about 80 quid a carburetor, which I think is pretty good. And what they do is they vapour blast them, clean them all up, polish the tops on them, and then plate any of the kind of linkages and stuff. Now, if you can't remember what my carburetors look like, remember this. Yes, 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 look at this. Does that look good or what? Those two will go on. Once we've got that on, basically the fuel system is complete. We can then put the water system in place. That's a few pipes, radiator, that kind of stuff. Then get some electrics wired up and then it's the big turn of the key. Right, that's that sorted. Next, water. Um, Pete, can you put the cardboard over the fan, mate? Yep. And that sits like that. Then there's a couple of corner brackets either side. Now, for some hoses to carry the water. This is an example of what came off the Range Rover. Now, it's a bit shabby, obviously, but even new. Black ones are a bit boring. So I scoured the country for somebody who could do a little better job for me. What we do is we send your hose away to our tool maker and what he does is replicates the bore of, uh, of your hose in steel. This is the tool that he's made for us and uh, this is what we build the silicone hose on. on. On a coolant hose of this type, the standard would be three plies. Depending on the application, you can increase or decrease the, the number of plies as is required really. So if it's a very high pressure application, you would add plies. The idea of us using a, a knitted fabric is it sort of has an open cell structure and the, the, the nature of the knitted fabric is such that it, it actually gives in, in all directions. So that if you're trying to apply the rubber to a, a, a very complex mandrel, you can actually get the rubber to go around. We actually put the first two layers on in one go. You need to put that onto the tool with the rubber face down onto the mandrel so that the, uh, the medium is carried through on, on the rubber surface. To give the hose a nice rubber finish on the outside, what we actually do is we reverse the top ply. That's what gives it the nice look. All we do to, to change the, the state of the rubber uh, from this sort of very soft, pliable, almost sort of plasticine state is to actually cure it and that polymerises the rubber. All we're doing now is, is blending the edges of the rubber one into another so you get a nice seamless join. By doing this it means that the wall thickness of the hose is sort of uniform all the way round rather than a, a sort of a build up in the area where the rubber actually overlaps. What Tony is actually doing is he's applying the curing tape and this serves two purposes. When you put the hose into the oven with the introduction of the heat, it shrinks and actually consolidates the layers of the hose together. And also, uh, because it's a, a smooth, shiny tape, you get a nice, smooth, shiny finish on the surface of the hose. Now we actually give that a, a, what's called a post-cure. Uh, so all of the hoses that we make during the day go into the oven at night and that just burns off any catalyst that may be left within the rubber. The hose has had its post cure and is uh, finished in the oven now and all we need to do is to trim the ends off. We make a, a comparison to the original hose and we lay that over the top of the silicone hose and mark the ends where we want the hose to be trimmed. Mark that end and then it's just a case of trimming the ends off. And that's essentially a finished item. The battery's a bit of a giveaway. We're on to electrics now. Oh yes, indeed, it's been a bit of a long day. So if we're all looking a bit tired, bear with us. We are working towards the big finish. Now, the coil. 
I refurbished that just in terms of its looks, cleaned it up and also cleaned up and painted this amplifier which is part of the electronic ignition. So that as a pack is now ready to go on. I've also been painting up the starter motor but I stripped out of it the solenoid to paint it and I thought it would be quite interesting to show you how it works. Basically the solenoid is this bit here which is an electromagnet and when you switch that electromagnet on, which you do when you turn your key past all the ignition stops and then the bit where it springs back, when you hold it against the spring, that activates the solenoid, activates the electromagnet, and then it draws the centre piston, if you like, of the electromagnet back in here against the spring. And as it does that, it pulls on a little lever inside the starter motor itself, and as it pulls back on there, it flicks out the gear that engages with the flywheel. And then it will turn the flywheel and turn the engine over until it starts. When you hear it's started and, and the engine's caught, you let go against the spring on the key, that switches off the electromagnet and it brings the little gear back. Show you how it works on the bench. You've got a battery wired up here. Just activate it, pulls it in, let go, pulls it out. Right, we're all wired up, ready to go. Main power supply to the starter motor via the bigger jump leads. And then this is your little switch, which is effectively a starter switch on the ignition. And it goes on there and here we go. Hopefully by that point, She's up and running. I think we're nearly there. Everything that could have gone wrong today has gone wrong today, so I'm not holding out much hope for this, but I promised you we'd try and start it today, and so we will. Les, you all right? Yep. All right, here we go again. Listen, I, to I told you it would run today, <laughs> and it's run today. Clearly it needs a bit more work. But hey, we're moving on. All those people who told me when I started this project that building a Land Rover is like a Meccano kit, I kind of right when it gets to the assembly bit, because you just have lots of these kind of things, which are for self-tapping screws and the whole lot either screws or bolts together. And what we've got to put in today are two floor panels, one either side. We've sorted out everything under those floor panels so they won't have to come out again. Then we have a diaphragm that goes around here that joins between the bulkhead and the cover that goes over here, the tunnel. Once that's in, we can then start work on finishing the dash, which is going to mean putting on the binnacle. I've got some extra instruments to put in, which we're going to put in here. I'm going to have to make a little plate to go in there before we then go on to put on the lid as it were. So to start with, just need to bang a load of these in. Where's the cupboard mark? Okay, let me out, Mark. Can't see. First bit in is the so-called diaphragm. You might be wondering why I'm laughing. Well, it's a little bit of a joke we had earlier on which wasn't capable of being transmitted, I'm afraid. So you can't join us on that joke. But this will go in here first because then the floor plates need to go on top of these little ears here. And the diaphragm, all it does is link the bulkhead and the tunnel. Right. Tunnel sits in nicely. A few more screws to get that in place, and then we can start on the dash. They're nice, aren't they? Very nice, <laughs> indeed. I think I need a haircut. Anyway, don't have time for one of those because it's instrument time and you know how I love my instruments. So this is the old panel, bit manky, don't like it at all. It had the cigarette lighter in one side and then the rear window wash wipe switch in the other side. We haven't got a rear window in terms of having a, a truck cab, so all that can go, bind it, but I'm going to use that as a template to be able to make my little aluminium panel for my three gauges. Now that just slots on there like that. Quickly draw around it. Also mark the screw holes. I will mark these holes in here as well because they'll just give me a guide to where I need to be centred up but they're probably not going to be exactly the right position. And then what I need to do is measure up where I'm going to have the centre of my bigger holes, 51mm holes for the gauges. So. Like that. 
Okay, and then I've got to cut it out, which is a combination of tin snips and a jigsaw. Right, there she goes, and you end up with a plate like that, which should be exactly the same size as the old template. Then it needs a bit of shaping. Ma, what's happening now? Ma, get on with it. With a bit of patience and using the right tools, what you end up with, it's not finished yet, but something that looks like that, and I'm really pleased with that. And what you get is a kind of the brushed aluminium look there, which I'll then lacquer just to cover and protect it. But you get that by using this tool, which is my polisher, but on top of it is a little Velcro pad, and you stick on this nylon scouring pad, and you can adjust the speed on this machine, and you can just gently just keep moving this to get that lovely finish. So, a little bit more on that, get it lacquered, then I can put the gauges in and put it in the dash. So, time to test fit. That looks very nice in there. Very pleased with that. With polishing though, the more time you put in, the better effect you get. I'm only test fitting them for now because I will get it off, polish it more and then lacquer it before finally putting it in. But that looks nice. Then the gauges themselves. First gauge in is the vacuum gauge, which is measuring um, an engine parameter effectively, but is a bit superfluous. It kind of makes up the numbers because you need your gauges in threes. Then the other two, first of them is volts. Very important monitoring the electrical system on this vehicle because it's going to draw a lot of power. It's going to have a two battery system with a split charger, but it's got a winch on it, it's going to have loads of lights on it and so on. So it's useful to know the state of your batteries. And then amperes, which is measuring current, which will be telling you positive or negative whether you're charging or discharging the batteries and basically how much current is flowing. So looks jolly nice that. This is the main binnacle or console. We've kept the original speedo in there, which is all cleaned up, but then I've put three new gauges in here, taking out the old ones. One of the old ones was a clock, for instance, not bothered about that. Who cares about time? But I put three in here to match the ones that I've got in the centre console there, and these are the really important instruments. Fuel level, oil pressure, and water temperature. Really like the look of that. It's amazing, just a little bit of money spent on some new gauges can actually transform what is actually quite a bland dash on a Land Rover. And then the whole lot plugs in with a few big multi-way plugs in the back, poke a few bulbs in, and jobs are good. And nice one. Oh, to go to the toilet bar. Now please do not try this at home. This is a setup gag for our show, Pete's here. Look. Well. <laughs> All right. No, no. It's not funny, is it? You're giving it away. <laughs> this is a quarter light window, like that, and they are different side to side, but we know this one fits here, like that is how it's going to go in. The rubber that goes around is basically two pieces. There's the main rubber itself, which is this bit here, and there's also this, which is the little filler strip that goes inside there to spread the rubber to seal everything up so you don't actually need any gooey sealant on this. The first job, the thin part there goes onto the frame, that's where the window is going to sit in there. So we're going to start it about there, like that, and then Pete is going to hold the glass in place when I try and put it in. And make a waterproof seal as well. Oh. You're catching on to the idea of windows, aren't you? I know. The basic parameters of a window are they let in the light, but not the water. You see? We, we've read all the books on this. Okay, let's get on. <laughs> that is in there. So far, so good, Tonto. Yes, good. Right, next bit 
you have to spray some lubricant on. Right. Use a bit of window cleaner, okay, because that way it doesn't damage the paintwork and it should work fine in terms of the lubricant. So we'll spray a little bit of lube. Your job yeah. is to make sure the glass doesn't slip out and fall and smash on the floor, okay? Like so you have to hold it, one hand on the inside, yeah. one hand on the outside, and hold it roughly in place, okay? So that I can work on it, all right? Okay? How's that? All right? Yeah. We have to feed it in like that. Literally flip the rubber around. You need to be careful with this tool because if it slips, you'll take all the paintwork off. Probably your finger as well. Probably. Oh, it's going in. It's nearly there now. This is the tool that you need to put the filler strip in because the filler strip needs to fit in this gap here, but you need to spread the rubber apart for that to fit. And you can see at the moment, it's nowhere near going to fit. So what you do is start at the bottom so you've got your join in the filler at the bottom and very carefully wangle dangle your tool in so it's like that then feed your strip through there like that get a bit of the old lube on and then very gently just feed in the filler strip as you carefully push the tool round the tool spreads the rubber apart increasing the size of the slot and allows the filler strip just to slot in place and then the rubber closes around it. There. There. Right, and then to finish... Yes. See, that's all in nicely like that, and then you give it a nice wallop to settle the glass into its rubber, OK? Just put your head there. No. I think we're quite good at that. That's OK. We've improved, haven't we? Yep. So that's one down, another quarter light to go, and then we've got to put in the big sliding windows in the back. Oh, I'm well chuffed, mate, well chuffed. Now, I've just discovered a bit of a problem because I thought that this window frame with the sliding windows in was actually screwed with self-tapping screws into the truck cab, but it's not. It was actually pop riveted. I didn't take it out. And we've now got the remaining parts of the pop rivets that are actually in the frame still in all the way around. Their little heads are poking up here. Now, normally, you'd just be able to knock these through with a little punch, but they can't come out because you can see down here in this groove, there is already a felt fillet in there for the windows to slide in, so there's nowhere for them to go. So what we've got to do is drill them out and then knock them out sideways so they fall into the gap behind that little fillet strip and then leave them there. Problem is they may rattle around, so the little trick to do with that is spray a little bit of wax coat, the stuff that you use for anti-corrosion in the chassis and so on, spray that into the back of this frame and then when it sets, it'll glue all the little rivet heads in place so they won't rattle around when we're driving along. Right, Pete, in you come. Be careful, it's got goo on it and he's the drain holes at the bottom. Okay. Lovely. Can you guide me in? You should be there, yeah? Yeah. Right, just hold it there for now. Don't do anything with it. Now my problem is the window's in, but the holes on this side aren't big enough for my pop rivet. Should have checked that first, but didn't. But hey-ho, we've got a five mil drill there, Pete. <laughs> Tell you what, it's hot in here. I'm glad the window's open. Have we go, Pete. Yep. We've decided to put the truck cab on before putting the headlining in, and to put the truck cab on, we have to put the windscreen on first. And I've just got mine in. drops on there like that. Yep. Right, then you just need to support it. A couple of brackets have to go on. You've got two different types of windscreens on Land Rovers like this. You can either have one that has a hinge here so you can fold it flat or a fixed one. This is obviously a fixed one because it's a truck cab. And what I've done is paint up these brackets the same colour as the strips around the side of the tub just to add that little bit of highlighting. Right, do them up. And that's all that's holding it on? Stay there. No, you're absolutely wrong. 
you're holding on as well awesome. until they're tight. Right, a bit of a juggling act this. Right, Pete, hold it there and just support it a minute. Yeah, got it? Got it? Yeah. Right, so slowly down. Right, down it comes. This has got to go in here. This way. You're fine, just straight down. Straight down. Yeah. Just got to locate these in here. There's just three little pegs that need to fit through the big round hole in the top of the bulkhead. Now, you may have spotted there's a hole in the back of my Land Rover tub. Well, obviously, that is where we're going to put a tailgate. Now, tailgates, lots of options. You could have a tailgate like this, which is your typical agricultural type tailgate that I did get from the scrapyard because this is what I was going to put on originally. Now, this would sit like this in this L, like that, and then it would hinge from the bottom and it would go like that. Looks a bit too agricultural for me. You could, by the way, also have one, second option, that side hinges. So it goes like that. Now, I don't like that one because you haven't got any strength across the back of this if you've only got it hinged on one side and just a latch on this side. So we're going to make a tailgate to go in here. And these are sand ladders, OK? Very useful for when you're in the old dodgy terrain and you need something to, to grip or get your tyres to grip on. So you can get these. They're made of aluminium with these lovely swage holes in. You need a couple of them. And we thought, well, where are you going to put them? on the Land Rover. You could put them on the roof, on top of the roll cage or whatever, but these would be perfect if we put them across there, like that, a couple of them. They act as a tailgate that we can just take off and put back on again, but they're also practical. So, we've measured them up. All we need to do is now cut them. Now, I put the top bolts in and they're held captive with these little half nuts. And the idea will be this should just slot on. One, two, like that. And then on the outside will be the wing nuts. And then I can use this to mark where I've got to drill the second hole in the bottom of the tub here, because this top hole was where the old Andalusas were for the original tailgate. Now, obviously, we've got to shorten these up and there will be a second ladder on here, but. Pretty nifty, huh? Lovely, lovely. Tell you what, these step cutters are absolutely fantastic. We get to that point in the build where we've got a kind of snag list of all the things left to do before the vehicle's ready. And one of the bigger bits is to put on the air system for the engine. Okay, it's a breather system. It has an air cleaner as part of it. But because we might be wading through water, we're also putting a snorkel on so that the engine doesn't drown as we go through deep water. Now, the problem is, it comes in a kit, most of it, and there's a lot of pipes. And I had a bit of a problem last night when I unpacked it, trying to work out where it all went. So I've laid it all out on the bench. I know what some bits are, and Pete May's going to help me sort it out. So these are quite difficult to get hold of a V8 air bin like this. The top of the snorkel, according to here, is a pre-cleaner. Oh, oh, yeah, go on, you carry on. That is ridiculous. You are joking. Oh, my God. No. Hey. All right, I'll see you later, yeah. Fine. Okay. Good. Nice. Right. It's not good news, mate. What? The board that I was waiting for to be able to put in the base of the truck cab yeah. has not arrived at home. Hmm. Can you believe that? Also, apparently, it's my wedding anniversary and I've forgotten. <laughs> Could be dodgy. Still. <laughs> Shame about the board. <laughs> and that'll go on there like that. And then basically you have a sealed system. All that's got fear in the engine bay. I've put in the main pipe that goes through the wing. The plate there is just screwed in with four screws to hold it nice and firm for the moment. I've also put on the little clip brackets that hold this vertical pipe that goes up to my little pre-cleaner. So that can pop on there for now. I'm not putting on anything tight yet, just making sure it all fits in place and doesn't foul on anything. That's fine. Okay, so the air comes swooping down this pipe through the little flexible bit, 
through the solid pipe through the wing and then out into this big flexi pipe here. Now this should run right across the engine and then hook into the input on the airbox. The only problem is it doesn't quite fit, it's not long enough and that may well be because we've got these extended turrets because of the big suspension on this vehicle, this pipe can't take its normal route. So I'll get an extension piece, that's not a problem, so I'll leave that off for now. The airbox itself is in place with its two brackets that fix onto the engine the cleaners inside it and then there's the output pipe to go on that goes from this side of the box here into the T-piece, out of the T-piece then connectors to both of the carburettors and those are the next bits to put on. First bit on is a little manifold and has a gasket on it between it and the carburettor so that just slots on there like that. Okay, There's a little O-ring that then slips over to seal the connection to the elbow. Now the elbow itself has a rubber sleeve on to connect it to the T-piece with a big hose clip and that then slots on to the T-piece on the one end and over the O-ring onto the carburetor manifold. And then finally the connector that goes from the output of the airbox into the T-piece, one big hose, and that goes onto the airbox like that and then onto the T-piece. So, all the pipes are nearly in place. When they are, tighten up all the clips and we're sorted. Me rock slider. What's a rock slider? Well, a rock slider is what it says it is, basically. It goes on the side of the vehicle in place of some rather weak aluminium panels that would go down here as sills. And this then goes on to protect you against, if you slide against a rock or even a tree, it'll hit this first without denting your bodywork. It's pretty solid. They're made of steel tube that's bent and then welded onto a steel box section. You can get all kinds of sliders and beams to put on the side here in place of sills. So there are lots and lots available. These are pretty simple in their design, but I just think they look pretty nice indeed. All right, okay. So I'll need just to nip those up with a spanner, but they look brill but obviously incredibly practical as well, because also, as well as protecting your bodywork from rock impact, also this is quite a nice little step to get inside. This is one option for a front winch bumper. They weigh an absolute tonne, but then they have to be pretty substantial, because obviously, if you put a winch on, you're putting it under a lot of pressure. So if we just unwrap this for you, we can show you what they look like. Les, can you grab the other end of this, mate? And you probably remember from earlier shows how we had to modify the end of the chassis here from the Range Rover fittings on the front of the chassis to fit this Land Rover bumper, but it slots on absolutely perfectly, and there's just two bolts either side that hold it in place, and it just transforms the front of the vehicle. But also, it's going to act as a fixing point for some of the front spotlights and also obviously protects the whole of the front of the vehicle from an impact. We've then got to put the winch, which is a very big unit, between this bar and the radiator. And to do that, I've had to modify the front panel, which I had to do after I painted it, which is not ideal. But I had to cut out the whole of the bottom section that ran across there to allow the winch further back, which is what you'll see in a minute. And the whole idea is to try and get the winch and the bumper as far back as possible towards the axle so you have the minimum distance between the axle and the front of the vehicle because that means you've got the maximum approach angle getting up some kind of incline. So, the winch. Now this is a bit of a tight fit. Right, when you let it, up we go. It's not too bad carrying this with two people. With one person it is very, very heavy and it drops in. You can see how much juice it uses by the size of these cables that supply it. Okay, goes over the top. Happy? Yep. What was that? A nut. Okay, drop that in there like that. Comes my way a bit. I told you it was a tight fit. You can see there's only literally space for two fingers here between the radiator and the back of the winch, but that's not a problem at all. It needs four bolts to hold that in place, and then the wire from the winch will come out through this little letterbox slot, and then come through this fair lead, which will just bolt in that position there. When you're travelling along, the wire will come through there, through the rollers, and then hook onto one of these here. We've got one either side. They're self-recovery eyes, which you use when you're trying to recover yourself effectively, because you pass the wire out round an obstacle like a tree or something, something pretty sturdy, and then bring it back to the vehicle. This is five-bar tread plate, aluminium, 
so called because you can see on the underside it's upside down at the moment you can see these five bars in little squares some people call it checker plate you often see it on the outside of Land Rovers I wanted to avoid using much on the outside because I don't really like it too much um, on the exterior of the vehicle I will be using a couple of panels on the tops of the wings just to strengthen them but I thought yesterday it'd be good to use up a bit of extra I've got of this as interior door panels because the problem with those series three doors I absolutely love them to bits because they say Land Rover all over them with the little sliding windows but because they're single skinned the chances are somebody's going to kick their foot at the door when they open it and they're going to put a dent in it which would be an absolute disaster so a couple of little door panels on the inside will protect that and I'm cutting them out of this by just using a template and the reason that I've had to cut this out is because the Land Rover doors I don't think are perfectly square as you might expect with Land Rovers as you well know if you've been watching this whole series so making the template at least you can make it the exact shape and it is worth making a separate template for each door and all I've done is just lay that on the top like that really really obvious stuff this drawn round it this is a little cut out here for where we've got the buckle the leather buckle that's acting as a door strap at the moment um, and this down here uh, I think it's where the hinge bolts through but this bit we've left a little drainage hole there so if any water does get inside the door between the two skins this is the lowest part of the door when the door opens so it will run out we'll also wax coat inside so I've got to cut this out once I've cut it out I'm just chamfer off the edges make it all nice and neat check it fit and then I'll be able to screw it on Bit of sound deadening to stick on the back ear like that that will fit in there like so it's quite flimsy this panel so a little bit of sound deadening will help it's the kind of stuff you have on the inside of your doors so in it goes there we go. it's funny when you're working on a vehicle like this you suddenly find yourself all kinds of jobs you never thought you'd have this was not on the original list but I think it's definitely worth doing. The other thing you really notice, particularly at three o'clock in the morning, is how it's all those little jobs that seem to take forever. It's like, I must have spent an hour and a half or two hours just P-clipping pipes in the engine bay. It's not a very interesting job, and, uh, but it has to be done. So there we go, that's that. Then we've got my panel, basically the same as before, but just put some of this sticky back foam on the back to help seal it, and just countersink the old holes in there. That will drop on like that. I haven't finished on the doors yet though. I put those panels on the inside so that peat mate doesn't kick a big dent in my doors. But also, I've got to reglaze the remaining window top, which is this bit, detachable top from a Series 3 door. Now, I don't think I ever showed you how bad the original doors were that I was going to steal from my little 90, OK? They were the wind-up windows, very trendy, some would say. I don't particularly like them myself because they don't smack of the kind of old Land Rover thing that I like. But this is a door that we took off. It didn't look too bad until we took the interior panel off, but then things started getting a bit dodgy down here. And this is just knackered. Now it is rebuildable and these are very expensive items. If you try and buy replacement new versions of these, you'll part with a lot of cash. So at some point we will sit down and repair these because we all know how good Les is at making brackets and things, don't we Les? Yeah, but very slow. But very, very slow. It takes him days and days and days. So Pete. Are we done with this? No, just stay there a little bit longer. OK, so we're going to put it together. All we've got in terms of the door is the old sliding windows, all right? So there's two windows. There's that pane. There's that pane. And there's that pane. I was going to, I was going to say that. <laughs> just remember whose show it is. Yeah, okay, OK, I do the words, you do the directing. And by the way, can you go and put the little bumperettes on the back? Thanks, Pete. OK. It's all a matter of fillets and runners to put these windows in. There's two windows. The front one is a fixed window. That gets gooed in place. And then it's the rear window that slides to be able to stick your elbow through it. So the first thing is to put the bottom runners in. It's just held in by three self-tapping screws. So that just drops in there like that. They've been a little bit damaged, these runners, when they were taken out. It's not a job we did, but um, we're going to have to sort that out to make sure the window slides properly. Just locate those. Right, OK. Now, plonk the window down. The next thing is to put a load of goo in. Now this is a sealing window sealer, but it's also a pretty good adhesive as well, which is perfect for this job. Just need a nice steady bead coming all the way around because you want it to squeeze out a little bit around the frame. So you can then clean it off afterwards. Okay, that's that. Then window up again. So what you do now is you get your glass, 
Then the window drops in on the outboard side of that first runner we've put in, between that and the goo that I've laid on the window frame. We drop it in, and you press that in just to squeeze it against the goo. Make sure it's all oozing out around the frame. Excellent. Now we can put the rest of the fillets in, and then drop in the sliding pane, and we're sorted. And then the finished window just drops in these holes right through the door top. And all we've got to do is make sure that the rubber sits in the right place. Two nuts is all that holds it on. Ah, uh, yes, indeed. The first time I've ever had a car seat with my name on. Pete Mate's got one as well, and he's very proud of having a seat with his name on too. Anyway, these two seats are obviously race-style seats. You could put standard seats in this, but we decided to go kind of a bit racy with it because of the fact that we want to go off-road, and we might go to some fairly unusual places and at unusual angles and so forth. So these are FIA-approved internationally race seats, also MSA, Motorsport Association in the UK approved. They're a tubular steel frame construction. It's padded and sprung all the way around, so it supports you brilliantly, and it will take a five-point harness, so two through here, two through here, and then one up between your legs through there, which is very important to stop you submarining if you had a head-on impact where you kind of disappear underneath the seat belts and forward. Very light seat as well, which is really, really good. Fixing them in is dead straightforward. We have the seat box already, which is one of the main parts of the bodywork in the vehicle. And all we've cut out is a piece of five bar tread plate. The seat runners, it's a fully adjustable back and forward seat, just bolts to the tread plate with four bolts and some spacers. These little spacers slot in underneath the runners. The only downside we have, having a truck cab set up, with this project vehicle, is the fact that we're not gonna get as much aft movement in the seat as we would if it was another type of vehicle, which means that I'm not going to be able to push my seat as far back as I might like, but then I'm not very long-legged, so I should be okay. Right, just need to be a bit careful because the edges of this checker plate, the tread plate, are pretty sharp and they'll take all my paint off. So it slots in back first. Now I've made it so it's pretty tight to this side with these little wings on here so that I've got the maximum space possible in between for a cubby box which can be a secure box in the centre so I'll just shuffle my way a bit and then it just bolts down in four places that's one of the original fixings and the other two the other side we've had to drill holes through the bulkhead and then we'll put some plates underneath to bolt it in but if we just put them in place for now Pete, if you can do that yeah. then I can put the seat back and see if there's enough leg room. That goes back, that's as far back as it'll go. Come and join me. Come and join me. Ooh, last time I sat in a seat like this, I was racing a car around a circuit. Ooh, that's very comfortable. Mm. Very, very comfortable. It's very supportive on the back, isn't it? Ah. Yeah, leg room's a bit confined, but then Land Rovers are like this. I mean, it's not much better when you've got normal seats in, to be honest, in a mm. truck cab. Mm. But we do need a very small wheel, really, which is a good job we've got power steering. <laughs> Actually, who needs a steering wheel? We'll just put a set of mole grips on. And I can I'll, just steer it like I'll that. Just close the door, see if it cuts the noise out. Don't. Don't close the door? No, because the door might damage. Fall off. No, no, because it might damage because of the paint. We've got to adjust okay. it. He just wants to try everything. Where's the windscreen wipers? Can't we get those going? Well, funnily enough, normally you find them on the outside of the windscreen. <laughs> We're set up for suspension geometry and wheel alignment and all that kind of malarkey. Now, I've never done this before, but my mate Ian's brought along the kit, as I said, and sorted it out for me so that I can have a go, all right? So the first thing you've got to do is find your icon on here. So we click that. Hey, hey! 1981, 1995, a Land Rover, Range Rover Classic. That's the database we've now selected. And the computer will basically tell us what to do on the vehicle. So we've got the rear axle jacked up at the moment, 
and then these sensors on the wheels. And we've got to go around wheel by wheel, first of all, checking a thing called run out. And run out is all about when you rotate the wheel to see if there's any movement of the wheel like that, to kind of wobble, if you like. And that could be because you've got a damaged wheel, or it could be because this apparatus hasn't been put on the wheel correctly. So you kind of need to set up the computer first to make sure it's happy with the run out. So every wheel has got the same kit on it, which is this cradle with three pickup points, one, two, and three there. And the center shaft here should be in line with the axle. So a straight line through there and through the center of the axle. On here, you've got a little bubble so you can check that the whole setup is level in terms of this machine which has the infrared transmitter and sensor that creates a box effectively around the vehicle by communicating with the other sensors around. So you've got this infrared box and then the computer can tell where every wheel is in space within that box and that's how it calculates all the parameters that we're trying to look at. So to start with we have to do the run out. First job is to rotate the wheel so that I know exactly where I'm starting from because I'm going to rotate it again in a minute for the computer to sense. So that's about that. Then I need to set up the infrared sensor receiver so that that is completely level with the bubble on top. There, like that. And then all I have to do is press this button here but very gently without joggling everything. So that means now, with that in that position, I can then loosen this off Rotate the wheel through 180 degrees until this point is at the top. So I know I've gone 180 degrees. It doesn't need to be absolutely perfect to there. Lock up the bobble so that I know it's all level again, like that. And then gently press the button a second time. And if it all comes up green, as it has. So the computer's happy with that. The run out is acceptable, so I can just loosen off the clamp and then I've got to do each wheel in turn exactly the same procedure. Right, I've got four greens in terms of run out so I can move on to the next stage and the computer gives you all the prompts of exactly what you need to do. I need to put in now four of these turning plates under the wheels. You then lower the Land Rover onto them and this means that when you're adjusting any of the parameters and the geometry, it allows the wheels to move in any direction because they can basically slip and slide in relation to each other. So that slides under there like that. I then need to put one of these turning plates under each wheel, lower the vehicle down onto them, give it a joggle to settle the suspension, then put a brake pedal depressing machine which holds the brake on before I can then go on and do the other test that the computer wants me to do, which includes doing a caster swing. So, after all that tomfoolery with the technical kit on the vehicle, this is the data we've harvested. It's split between the front axle and the rear axle. The front axle is the top half of the screen, the rear axle is the bottom half. We take the front axle first, the things it's measured for us are camber, caster, toe and a thing called SAI, which is steering axis inclination. To explain those individually, they are difficult things to explain these, I have to say. So I've come up with my little model, okay? This is an axle wheel on either end, okay? We're traveling in this direction, so this is the front axle. If we go for camber first, camber is when the wheels do either that and they move in that plane to go in like that. That's positive camber, that's zero camber, and that's negative camber, okay? Next one on the list is caster. Well, caster you kind of need to look at from the side because if that's the axle like that, with caster, if you rotate the wheels like that, so the axle effectively rotates like that as well. So you've got this angle through the wheel there. Going that way, it's negative caster, which is what you get on a shopping trolley at a supermarket. If it comes back the other way, you have positive caster. Okay, and the final one on there of the main ones is tow. Well, that's easy. If you're looking at the front of the vehicle like that, that's toe in, that's toe out, okay? And toe in is a positive figure because you could end up with lines across here making a cross and a cross is positive. Okay, I hope that helped. SAI, steering axis inclination, is a kind of mathematical thing that's worked out from the camber and the caster and I can't really explain any more than that because my brain won't handle that. 
But basically, in terms of the results, it's all pretty good news. On the front, camber and cast are okay, but the toe is not good, so that needs a little bit of adjustment, which I'll do in a second. On the back, camber and toe are okay, and thrust line is absolutely perfect. And thrust line is basically the centre line of the rear axle and the centre line of the front axle follow in exactly the same path. So the rear wheels and front wheels are exactly parallel, so you're not having any crabbing going on. And that thrust line is basically adjusted by our panard rod across the front, which has got the rose joint on the end. So that's all pretty good. The only thing we need to do is the toe in, toe out on the front. So to adjust the toe in, toe out on the front axle, you have to play around with this adjuster here on the track rod. The track rod runs from one hub to the other right across the vehicle and has got a ball joint on either end. I've undone both the clamp bolts on this adjuster and then all you need to do is get a big piece of steel since it makes a bit of a mess of the adjuster this I have to say but you can always have a bit of paint afterwards and then you just grip it and turn it. And as it turns, it turns on the threads to either effectively lengthen the shaft or shorten it. Or the rod, I should say. I can actually see the computer from here. So I need to get a smaller number, so I need to rotate it towards me. OK, and we've just got to keep going until we get down to zero total and zero on both wheels. Right, we're down to point one. All oh, right, here we go. Tell me if it gets to zero. It's coming, it's coming, and it's... It's there! Yes! Yay! Hooray! Have a listen to this. Does that sound good or what, eh? Amazing. Hey? 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 Brilliant. Fantastic. Brilliant. We can't listen to this all day, though. There's work to be done. But maybe just another couple of seconds. Yeah. It's finally time to sort out the back of this tub in terms of the floor. I tell you what, in a workshop, where does all this dust come from? Because we try to keep this place as clean as possible, and we are at the clean stage of the build, but it just gets covered in everything. But never mind, we'll wash it later. Two materials I'm going to use here are the five bar aluminium tread plate. So this will sit across the top there, cover most of this hole where the roll cage goes through, and then also come down the side, down to here. And then on the base will be this stuff, which comes by a number of names. Um, I think it's called phenolic board, but also buffalo board, or I know it's trailer board. It's what's on our trailer for towing the vehicles. And it's rough on this surface, and then you can see it's ply, and it's got a smooth surface underneath. And that then will just sit as a complete piece in the base like that. Now, in terms of cutting this, because Land Rovers aren't square inherently, you've got to assume they're not, it's much better to cut a template. Thanks, Pete. You always keep the cardboard that you have from any deliveries, because you will use it for templates, for absorbing oil underneath vehicles or whatever. And this will slide in here to fit round the foot plates of the roll cage. The only problem I've got is down here, there's a little bit of a gap of about six mil between my template and the foot plate here for the roll cage, so I'm going to add six mil on there when I actually cut it on the board. So I can mark it up on the board and then start cutting. The important thing with this, and it really is pretty obvious, so I'm not trying to teach grandma to suck eggs or anything here, is the fact that you need to make sure your template's the right way up. I'm actually cutting this board upside down. The reason for that, if you look at the skill saw I'm going to cut it with, the blade rotates obviously that way around, so it's going to cut up from the bottom. So to avoid getting any snags and chips off the rough side of the board, which is the side you're going to see, you need to make sure it's cutting that side first and then any snags will be on the underside. Then you whip the templates off, the lines are pretty faint, which is not a problem, but then you can go across with a straight edge now and then scribe these more heavily before you cut. Right, that should just slide in there, like that, lovely jubbly. Fits beautifully at the back, no problem at all, but 
If you look underneath, it's not sitting down as well as it should do because it's sitting on top of these bolts, which are part of the suspension. So we need to mark those where they are on the underside of the board so I can then route out a little recess for them. The way to do that, little tip, line everything up, make sure it's in the right place, and then take a big omer and give it a belt. Like that. Like that, and that'll mark the tops of the bolts, put a little indent in the bottom of the board, and then that, I can use that as my spot for routing. <laughs> Now I've sorted out the floor, I can work on the wheel boxes, which is slightly different, working in aluminium. And also, I need quite a complicated template here, because the way this brace goes down through the wheel box itself means that I can't get in one piece. It's obviously got to be in at least two pieces. And then I've got a problem where trying to get aluminium in to here, past the roll cage, and then past this piece of aluminium here is going to be quite difficult. So what I've come up with is a plan, I've made the template already, is basically a three-piece jigsaw. The bit at the back goes in like this. The way I've shaped this across here allows this to slide in like that. The back piece can then drop in like that. And then the third piece will just drop in across there like so. And I reckon that'll make quite a neat little job. And then I've got one piece that I can just put all the way along the side. Right, all cut. This <coughs> will slide in there like that. Just let it overhang for now. That will go in there, like that. That will go in there. But this will overlap the one on the side, which I've also cut. So this will slide in there like so. Then these will be bonded onto here and screwed down as well, as will the base. And then on the base, the sealant will run lengthways like that, so if any water does get under it, it can run all the way to the end and out through drain holes at the bottom. So that's one side, another side to go, and then I can put some lights on. The very last thing is to put on the accessory lights, the absolute finishing touches for a vehicle like this. We have a number of them. So, four lights on the front. These two will just be switched on from a control panel inside the cab as extra lights. They'll have covers on most of the time, though. These, though, are very interesting spotlights because they're actually dippable, so they will work on dip and main beam. The only problem is, though, we've had to mount them on the side. So if we mount them on the front, they'd be up here somewhere. So what we'll be doing is rotating the whole lens inside. It's a little job we've got to do later to get them to a point they're in their normal orientation for the dip and main beam. So those four will go on there. Next job is four across the top. What? Uh, across, mind the paintwork. Ready when you're up. Yeah, we'll go get the lights then. Have you been watching the cricket or something? Yeah. It's not a good look, is it? So, four lights on the front of the roll cage, but that's not it because there are two more lights, work lights, to go on the back. One little job we've got to do before we take it off-road is to check the articulation of the suspension. So, I've got my mate Chris Bashel over here from Surrey Off-Road to actually bring along this rather amazing ramp setup to, to check the articulation of the suspension. So I'm the driver and he's checking whether everything's okay and it's um, just a bit steep. Put her in gear, handbrake on, turn it off. Hey! Clearance. Uh, tire's jammed against the shock absorber this side. Is it? Yeah. I'm getting out to take a look. Oh my word. You right there, mate? <laughs> oh my word. 
So, this side's a bit of a problem then. Well, the tyres, well, I've stopped it before you can, can go further yet. Yeah? Uh, the tyres already pushing the shock off its mouth. It's rubbing on the shock, but put your hand around the tyre. Yeah, I can bit. see it. So we are proving that the articulation is fairly dramatic. Obviously, when it went up forwards, we do seem to have a slight problem where we're getting rear wheel steer, um, and also the wheel is touching on the compression side, the wheel's touching, or the tyre's touching the um, shock absorber, the damper, and also is very close to where our mounting point is for the roll cage. So what I need to do is have a chat to the people who make the suspension and see if that's a kind of common problem and there's something we can do to, to resolve that. Um, but it's pretty dramatic, isn't it? is all good and well but it's not the real world and I want the real world for my Land Rover so we've come to Brick Kiln Farm just outside Alton in Hampshire to put my vehicle through its paces for the first time off-road and I think we found quite a good location. Now just to go back to the old suspension problem we had before just to remind you when this was fully articulating the inner side of this tyre was binding up against this huge damper here. Now I've spoken to the manufacturers they said yep yeah, cool it is a problem that can happen sometimes and it's to do with the wheel offset. Two solutions potentially one is to put some spacers behind the wheels here where they bolt on just to bring the whole wheel out very slightly the other is to get some wheel rims with a bigger offset but it shouldn't be a major problem but I'm not going to do it until we've done some more testing with it to see if there's anything else we need to fiddle with and that's the whole thing about building a vehicle like this you never really finish it because you take it out you work with it you play with it you find out the problems and then you keep solving them there'll be a new product that comes around you buy it you put it on the vehicle you see how good it is that to me is the fun of owning a Land Rover like this but so far me Phil and Les have spent a staggering two and a half thousand hours on this Yes, it's been a tough old six months. Phil Hinsley from Muddy Tracks has been with us as a project consultant, working with me and Les the whole time, putting us on the kind of straight and narrow. And it has been hard, hasn't it? It has. It has. Very hard. How often have we been there at one, two, three in the morning? <sighs> I've lost count. The wife will know. <laughs> we all started off clean shaven as well. <laughs> Almost. We ended up with beards and things. I lost my hair. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the stress and the worry of it all. This is a very good location, isn't it? Because you is. come here testing your stuff. It is. You've got all sorts of terrain here and it's a very big area, you've got acres of land to basically do what you want to do. All right, so can you act as co-pilot, help yep. me with kind of gear selection? I have done a bit of training, obviously, as you know, um, but this is quite unusual terrain and yes. there is a bit of mud and water and stuff as well. So if you can help me with the gear changes, the use of the diff lockers, all that kind of stuff, yep. and let's go play. Okay then. It's still on. Right, tap the valve. We've got a bit of a problem. You may remember earlier on the programme, I said one of the problems we got with the engine was the oil pressure relief valve was sticking, which was giving us no oil pressure effectively, and the oil pressure warning light was coming on. It's just happened again. We think it's because there's some little grooves in the housing and it's getting stuck in them. So rather than take the whole thing off, which would involve us then having to reprime the oil pump with Vaseline, which could take forever, um, we're just seeing if we can just tap the end of it with a hammer, good old hammer. Um, that'll release it and give us our oil pressure back, and then we'll change the whole unit later. So, do I check yeah. it? Yep. Yeah. Oh yes, it's all sorted, sir. Done. Sorted. Thank you very much. We can go back to playing. Very chuffed with this. Very, very chuffed. Now we don't know whether this is a terribly good idea, but as a bit of a laugh, we're going to try and go back up this hill through the mud backwards without diff lock so we're in just reverse 
in low range. And um, Bill's never done this before, so it'll be very interesting to see what happens. We'll never break it. I'll tell you what, I was really worried about the fact that when we took this out off-roading, I was going to get it dirty, but it's just such a laugh. I'll be really disappointed if it doesn't go home covered. Right, here we go. Are you ready? Yep. We'll never make it. You'll never make it? No. As I said right at the outset of this show, the reason I wanted a four-wheel drive is you can't do that kind of thing in an AC Cobra. So yet again, another little mud wallow, and we're only using first gear, low ratio, and no diff lock. So far, we've managed everything, which kind of suggests we might well have over-engineered this vehicle. <laughs> No diff locks at all. No. <laughs> hey, now, you may be wondering where good old Pete mate is. Well, sadly, he had to go into hospital because he's got a bit of a heart complaint that they're investigating for him, and he's absolutely devastated he's not here today. And he would love, I tell you, love to have done what we're going to do next. You know what they say on 4x4 courses? You have to walk what you want to drive, so go on. But I'm not driving. No, but I am, and your boots don't fit me. <laughs> Can I just say how much it stinks? It does. It absolutely <laughs> reeks. <laughs> oh, yes, indeed, my friends. This is why you build your very own four-wheel drive. That's it from a 4x4 four four is born. What you've seen over the last seven and a half hours, 15 half hour programmes, is a 41-year-old dream come true for me. All those manuals I collected when I was six years old because I couldn't afford to get a Land Rover, my parents didn't have one, and my dreams to own one have all come true. I now have what I think, for me anyway, is the ultimate Four by four. I really hope you've enjoyed watching it. We'll catch you in the workshop jolly soon. I've got more playing to do, and this bit's deeper. Just forgot something. Say goodbye, Pete. Goodbye, Pete.